Frank is now vice president. I'm going to ask Clive Dunn, but he's a bloody nuisance. So. <laughs> Is that all right, then? Yeah, it's right. <sighs> so you've got some, he's got, he's got the questions there. Ah, I've got a few, well, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a, a few more coming from the floor. Right, I'll have a good one. Thank you. We don't have my eyes, Victor. The members will know the answers, we don't. <laughs> right, I'll ask the members then, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, good, just sit here. Yeah. 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 Right, have you said a quick lot to these? Or one of, one of the uh, seems to be the most asked question is, what were your favourite episodes and why? Well, um, <laughs> one of my favourites, I think, was uh, the day the balloon went up. Yeah. Oh, it's been a lot of fun doing that, anyway, because you can, if you see it, you can see it. I mean, it wasn't an easy one to do. Done over a period of what, two or three days of chasing that plastic balloon, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah. um, I wasn't in it. No. <laughs> no, no. And, um, <laughs> yes, that was that was one of my favourites. Um, I don't know, it's so difficult, honestly. To do. It is really. If you, if you suddenly see one now, you say, "Oh, I remember that. Oh, that was great to do." But um, you see, one of the problems was that we were filming for. We went away and filmed for probably uh, seven or eight episodes at a time. Filmed for ten minutes, whatever it was, for one, ten minutes, another. When we came back into the studio. It was then four days rehearsal, record, they would insert the film, and that was that done. And we went home, and honestly, I can say this quite truthfully, I went home and I didn't remember what I had done in that episode, because I had the script for the next one in my hand, ready to look at on the Saturday morning. So you had to block out what you'd just done. So it was quite, it was quite difficult to, it became a bit of a... Well, any television is like a factory, really. Is that a real balloon? I think one of my... was. It was a real one. Yes, it was. I think one of my favourites was the Royal Train. Oh, yeah. Bill, myself, Teddy, on that thing. On that thing. And the train's chasing us. Yes. And Bill says to us, it's gaining on us, it's gaining on us. And they can't see. We might all have to jump off. We'll break our legs, but it'll save our lives. However, fortunately, we found they were in telecommunication or whatever it is. And although you couldn't see the driver because it meant to be private, with Pike and of course he couldn't drive a train to save his life, save <laughs> some other persons. And um, anyway, we were all right, weren't well, we? Yes, Bill? but we were actually chasing the train. You've got it right. Oh, we were chasing <laughs> nobody, no. nobody. Somehow there was a moment when the train the seemed train. to be. Yeah. You yeah. said to us, the train is gaining on us. And remember this, well, you'll have to jump, you <laughs> said to me. <laughs> Didn't, didn't you get your pocket caught in the... Oh, you did? Yes, yes. I did. That, that I thought, funny. there's it, another rupture it case. Got, it, got, it got caught in my pocket, and it was a, an, an embankment there, and it would, if I'd gone off, there would have been no chance for it. <laughs> and Teddy, with great presence of mind, just went like this to my pocket and ripped the pocket, and the thing came away. So Teddy really saved me from a... Ah. Oh, no, well done, Teddy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And we all ended up in that one getting soaking wet, didn't we? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes I've been up there many times. Yeah. Well, he was forever falling in rivers, but I mean, we, we, we yeah, got wet in that one. Yes. Even sometimes unintentionally, weren't you, yes. Bill? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. I remember that one, the one scene, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. We'll cover it. We'll talk about it. There's a, there's, there's a question which I wouldn't have think, thought of asking, but I'm quite curious. What was written on the back of the harmonium? <laughs> oh, I don't think you should do it. What's if you want to say, I'll there? shut my ears. <laughs> suitable for the vicar. <laughs> well, I don't know because I didn't go up into the tower anyway, so. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it was conjecture as to what it might have been. <laughs> they never told me anyway, <laughs> just as well. Some His reverence wouldn't have liked it. There's some rude remark from the floor manager, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good discussion. Oh, dear. All right, I've got one for Eric. Ah. Yeah, I've got perhaps, some. Perhaps we should go back on that one about the oh, harmony. Right. Just say that perhaps there ought to be some suggestions in one of the magazines. <laughs> 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 what was on the back oh, Jack will be taking notice of that. <laughs> what was the lead up to it? I can't remember. They, they, 
was, what was he asked? Had he written something on the back of the harmonium or somebody? Somebody had written something on the back yes. of it, yes. So was it, a, so was it one word or, a, or, or several words? I don't think we know, Bill. <laughs> I don't think we know. But, well, but to put the actual, I mean, to, for it to go into the magazine, yes. you'd have to know actually whether it was one phrase or one word. Yeah. You could invent a phrase or you could invent one word. I think one word is the un inadvisable. <laughs> <laughs> Phrase would be better. Yes, yes. Right, right. Yes, yes. That's the actual we need them. We said not them. Yes, that's Good right. Good old Tom, I like that. Bearing <laughs> <laughs> that in mind. And so go on, Brewery. Right. Um, for the captain, when you're when in the episode of the captain's car, why did you forget to immobilise the mayor's car? And did the mayor ever notice the respray? Why didn't you immobilise his car? That's what I want to know. Oh. <laughs> I was in such a state. Oh, oh yes. 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 Was the reason. You were frightened of getting kissed, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Who's that the one that I got kissed? <laughs> <laughs> the one where you missed out. Oh, right, yes. Oh, yes, yeah. the French general. Do you know, I think I'm going to be in a play with him. I think... Oh, John Hart Yeah, really? Oh, no, 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 it's another one. They don't stop it, no. But you know know the funny thing about that episode? Um, The car coming up to the town hall. uh, Because... Captain Mannering said, Oh, Sponge, you drive the car. Well, of course, I can't drive. I'm hopeless. But I was sitting in this car, and I'm not sure, I think it was... Desmond Callum Jones was sitting next to me. And between my feet was one of the technicians with a little monitor set, and his hand was on the bottom of the wheel while mine were on the top doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so he was actually driving the car. It was only onto that square at Thetford, you know, from out of shot into the from the town hall. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like this, and this little man sitting between my feet with a camera. <laughs> and here I thought all this time Colin could drive. <laughs> only other people silly, Bill. Only other people silly, that's all. <laughs> Oh dear. I've got a question here from uh, David Jeffries. Oh no, there's some people written here, Tom. He's a great fan of John the Measure. Can anyone tell any stories or anecdotes about John? Uh, I'll tell you, he made a real thing of being vague. And when we were on the tour, I mean, he, he just made a virtue of this. He said to me one day, Frank, what do you do about your dirty washing while you're on tour? And I said, well, I, I find a laundry that will do it within a week, and I take it there. So he turned to Teddy, and he said, what do you do, Teddy? Teddy said, oh, I, I, I'll take it down to the laundrette. <laughs> and John said, what, what do you mean you, you sort of sit there and watch it going round the whole <laughs> So I said, well, what do you do, John? And he said, well, I, I just sort of leave it about the room <laughs> and somehow some kind person always does it. <laughs> 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 oh, about the watch, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> his watch didn't get, his watch needed winding one day and he got out and he was being made up quite early in the morning out there, sitting in the sunshine about eight in the morning. And uh, he said, I think my watch has stopped. Do you mind winding it up for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, there you are. I mean, there's stories about John. Yeah. Lovely yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Remember, he, he sometimes used to say, I don't want to eat in the hotel tonight. Well, that's fair enough. Um, uh, but uh, well, can we go out somewhere? I said, well, all right. Well, what do you want to do? I'd like some fish and chips. This is happening. Oh, yes. 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 And uh, so we go out and I said, you're not eating the fish and chips in my car. So it was quite late then, um, not even because I stink the car out. So he said, well, we'll find a place. And we went off a country road, having got the fish and chips, and there was a bus shelter. Nobody around at all. <laughs> a beautiful moonlight night. And the, the uh, light was shining on, across the top of the bus shelter. And we sat there eating fish and chips, and two local yokels came up, obviously being to the pub. <laughs> and as they passed, they said, Oh, look, them two old tramps over there eating their supper. <laughs> 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 
So we, we did all this, and, and we went to the, the National Stud up there, the Royal Stud, and we, we patted some horses. Over. Then we went on adventure. After staying a night there, we went on to, to Berry St. Edmunds, and we had just got the script for the stage show. And he said, where is this place, Billingham, where are we going to open? I said, it's on Teesside somewhere. I said, I haven't been there. He said, oh, yes. It worries me a lot, he said. I said, well, we won't worry about that later. And so we went round pub crawling in Ber Berry St. Edmunds because that was his hometown. And he got about half past nine and said, John, I've got to have something to eat. He said, oh, all right, fine, I'll go in. And we went into the brasserie of the Angel Hotel, I think, in Berry. Just yeah. the Angel, the big one there. And uh, this dear old lady came up after being there about 10 minutes and uh, with a tray. And uh, she said, and we ordered. Now, John was the great eater. He used to mess about with his food, cut a bit off and mess about with it, and all the scholar, whatever it was. And so we both ordered soup. She came back with the tray with the soup on it, and he'd been pondering about Billingham. And he suddenly looked up at this lady with the tray, and he said, oh, bugger Billingham. How can a word in any place anyway? I mean, no, he'd come on and shout, and I'm just cowed in the corner. Oh, you love, you were the worst of the lot. <laughs> <laughs> you never go at everybody, you would. Uh, we're using the church as <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Well, I don't know, really. I don't know what the answer to that one is. But, I mean, you, you can't cope with him. I mean, he'll, he'll come on and... I, I, whenever Bill's going to do something, I say, oh, you're going to do something classy now, like he played Candida's father or something. I said, what's he going to be like? He said, oh, it'll be like the warden. I'll just shout a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bill for him. Uh, yeah. It did actually happen. I mean, when I was doing Candida, I hadn't done a... Uh, a Bernard Shaw play at all, and the director is a very nice chap who I actually had met before and been directed by him, and he spent five hours going round the cast saying, have you worked out a background to your character? And I thought, this is funny, uh, this is a bit strange, and I've started to nod off a bit. And he keeps walking around, this is the day before we start rehearsing, and he said, well, I've got an assistant director, he'll want to ask you some questions as well, and then keep coming up and saying, oh yes, with the background, and he went on and on and on. And uh, I didn't say anything, right. So at the end of the session, he said to everybody, you've got your characters now, and you know what it's all about, you know where you came from, you know the mood you're going to be in when you come into the first entrance and everything else, which a lot of directors do. And he then sort of stopped with me, and I looked at him, and he said, uh, now, how are you going to play this? I said, like the warden without a helmet. <laughs> And that finished him. He walked, he walked away and, and sort of went to his assistant director and looked at him and, and, and gave me up. <laughs> that was it. He'd given me up. Oh, okay. That's how I did that. But you see, I think actually this all stems from Jimmy Perry, who who ran the rep at Watford when I first yes. knew Colin. That's right. Yes. And um, Jimmy Perry's motto was, if the play wasn't going very well, you did it louder and faster. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And that's that why, is true. That's why yes. Yes, Bill went yep. abundant with him. Yes, not your glass of wine. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. Yes, that was Jimmy's theory, wasn't it? Yes. Now Speed it up and get it louder. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what, what Ray Cooney says. Yeah. Actually, on stage, though, he says, if you're doing a play with Ray, he'll suddenly, suddenly, if he thinks he's flagging a bit, he'll turn around, <laughs> away from the audience, and say, louder and faster. But now do they get from you, Bill, wouldn't they? You, I mean, no end to the volume. Well, you could, you I could. tell you, I was in a play, and we were touring, and, and one of the dates was Richmond, you know, 
much money around it. It's a nice, nice day. And uh, I went into the, the pub after it, the performance, and uh, the, the, there was a couple, a dear couple, right near me having, where I was having a drink, and they were discussing the play. And uh, the lady said, oh, well, I, I enjoyed it, didn't you, Fred? Uh, yes, very nice. <laughs> yes, very nice. I do a good ice cream in there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, I quite like that. I quite like that one. It was, uh, I've seen it before. He, he was playing the inspector. He said, yes. He said, yes. You could hear that bugger in Surbiton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. A question I've just thought. Oh. Were your characters purely fictional or were they burst, based on people you knew? Sorry, what, what? Were, the, were the characters you, you portrayed purely fictional or were they, did you sort of base them on people you knew? Mine, mine, mine was based on a town clerk in the city of Watford who didn't get on very well, or Jimmy didn't get on very well with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, interesting. Uh, Said, the North Country bit yes, 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 yes. was, I, I was in an episode of Lollipop in 19, May 1972 with the Bakuns, Mount, Peggy hey, Mount, hey, Peggy, Peggy, Peggy Mount, Mount yeah. Bill Lodge and uh, Hugh Lloyd, Hugh Lloyd. Yeah. and uh, the two men that joined the Royal and Ancient Order of Crows. I was playing the part of the secretary crow in this episode. <laughs> so I had to wear a flowing garment, which when I did that looked like wings, and I had a peaked beak, which came down there. And I wanted myself to be seen on the screen in the hope that somebody would employ me again. <laughs> so I played my part like that. <laughs> it was a North Country situation. Just three, four months later, I got the call from the BBC to play the town clerk in Catalan, and I think it was Lollipop uh -huh. that got me. Your I mean, Jimmy, crow appearance Jimmy that did it. I, it, it was one of the best characterizations in the series. And I've got to say, it's the town, town that you made the town clerk because it was, it was exactly uh, as yes. one of Yes. That was the great thing, you see. If you suddenly got a character that came through with great truth, that's what made the series. Yes, 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 yes. It was marvellous because I mean, people have actually, uh, actually, there was no, there were no um, catchphrases made up for that show, and they came about through, through just somebody saying it uh, yeah. in rehearsal, probably, and then the writers would clock it, uh, and certainly one which I'm in. Uh, Eric's was that cool, that's nice. That's very nice. Oh, that's very nice. What about Pikey St. Kelly one time? Say what? Didn't Pikey St. Kelly? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, he only said it about twice. Was that Adley Bunny? Uh, no, 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 that, that was that, that written, written in, no, no, that, no. It, it wasn't, a, it wasn't no. a catchphrase, it was only shooting Mr. Mandarin, you're entitled to, no, that was, that was in the script, that was in the script, that was in the script, oh yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, but there were certain ones that were in the script, yes. simply because they, they'd heard something in the verse, yes. yes, and then put them in, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and of course, uh, things like stupid boy and so on, I mean, became cat friends. Oh yes, yes, But Teddy Sinclair always claimed he based his verger on a verger that he'd known, in right down to the yellow duster in the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, on the other hand, was very connected with the church, and I wouldn't dare to base the vicar on anybody I know. <laughs> 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 oh, no, 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 and if he based it on somebody we knew, they'd probably have the whole hierarchy on top Absolutely, of it. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> From the Archbishop yeah. downwards. <laughs> no, I, I, I knew an Eric Warden during the war when I was living on Dartford Heath, and he used to, he was a lovely man, he was a builder actually, Mr. Martin. And he would, um, you know, you see him during the day, and he was very good about uh, helping people so well. And then at night, he would put the, the Warden's uniform on, and, uh, Walk about the road, and what you, you used to say, I would get down the shelf, and I get down the shelf, down the shelf, up, down the shelf, up. <laughs> <laughs> we used to sort of pull that bit of horrible wood from 
outside the shelter and say, we're down in the shelter, Mr. Martin. Don't argue me, get down in the shelter. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the sort of thing, but he was an extraordinary man. You see, you could actually hear the, the shrapnel with a lot of guns on top. You could hear the shrapnel hitting his helmet, and he never flinched. I mean, oh no, not at all. He didn't mind. Phil, hit his helmet. excuse me, the BBC hierarchy, when the series started in 68, or just before it started, they were concerned about how the general public would view Dad's Army, because a lot of people thought it might be taking the uh, P. How did the real Dad's Army view the series? Oh, they loved it. Oh, yeah. Yes, they loved it. They all thought that it was exactly what they'd been doing. They didn't think it was a setup. No, no, they all thought it was wonderful. No, no, I don't, I, I honestly, I, I, that's a story that's gone around about the BBC thinking yeah. going to take the mickey. Yeah. Actually, what they said was, Paul Fox said, who the hell wants to watch a load of old men running about in a field? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why he said, burn the tapes. I don't want to know about the program. He said, it's not going on, and that's the end of it. So don't even do it. And they talked him around, and they made those first six. And uh, it went out on a Tuesday night, at a bad time, around about half past six in the evening, I think. Uh, and it didn't get any viewing figures because it's a bad time anyway. Ooh. But it was then. And so after three programs, he said, See, I'm right, aren't I? <laughs> no bloody good. <laughs> while, they were, while we were doing that, while they'd done that, they were also sending out the liver birds almost live. It was recorded two days before it went out. Holly James got flu. She, got, she couldn't do the last three episodes. So instead, of, they moved Dad's army to 8 o'clock on a Friday evening. And within three episodes, the ratings went up because of the because of the, the time scale and, and, yeah. the, and the time of you know the time of the week. And it suddenly went up from like a million to four million, eight million, suddenly now suddenly it was it was climbing the ladder after three episodes. And so Paul Fox resigned from the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> went to Yorkshire television. Yes. But, well, I mean, what, what, one kept meeting people on when we were on location, particularly, who would come up to you and say, I was in the Home Guard during the war, and what you lot, that lot, get up to is nothing to what we no, got up no, to. No, we've had so it. many of these, yeah, haven't we? Yeah, so yeah, many yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. I've got a whole collection of letters that tell you yeah, this. Yeah, you know. Bill Cotton, I think I put a bit in that uh, time ago. Yes. That Bill Cotton yeah. uh, was really not onto it at all. Said, well, he was head of the variety <coughs> department. Um, and it was, I think, uh, Tom Sloan, who was head of the BBC One, yes, yes. and uh, um, Michael Mills, who actually thought of the name of Dad's Army, of course, from the Fighting Tigers. And uh, they, they persuaded him that it should be done. Bill said, OK, well, I'll go along with you. Uh, Tom Sloan said, I want to do these programs. Um, after those, after the first three, so I want to do another six or seven. I don't think I don't remember that. And, uh, by the time we'd done sort of 26, I remember Bill Cotton actually coming up to Thetford on one of the locations out there, and suddenly this car arrived at Bill Cotton. He said, I just want to tell you boys uh, that I was wrong uh, because he said you got 18 million viewers last week. So, it's, I mean, he'd actually come and do it. I mean, Bill, but not Bill Cotton, or some of the famous band leader, uh, but it was nice for him to come up. And, and, um, I didn't hear that remark, and it was, I put it in this new book. And it was Arthur who came over to me and said, uh, the jig tar ratings, which I didn't know about the jig tar rating, whatever they were. He said, apparently it's 18 million viewers last week. So I'm just going to have another cream bun. <laughs> 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 totally different path. Oh, oh dear. well, I, I suppose, yes, I'm sure it would. Of course, I'm sure it would, yes. Uh, if you would have said without television, I would have said, well, yeah, I would have just stayed in the theatre, probably. Um, which I was in the theatre before Dad's Army. Doing and of course well. you had your radio work. As yes, well, I don't a lot. Yes, I don't yes, a lot of radio. Work, radio work. Which, um, yeah. I mean, from those radio programmes, Beyond Our Ken, well, first of all with um, Razor Laugh, and then Beyond Our Ken, Around the Horn, uh, it elevated me a certain, to a certain extent away from the rather sort of crappy summer shows and pantomimes that I've been <laughs> doing, uh, which were getting a bit better, I must say. Um, but I think it was. Yes, it was those radio shows that really then elevated me up to another. And don't forget, I had to cope with those uh, with Kenneth Williams and Hugh Paddock and Freddie Marsden, who were very good. 
I came into it as uh, uh, and having to, to learn lines very quickly. Within two hours, we only had two hours to work with that for those radio programs. And to cope with people doing that as you're moving up to the microphone or putting your foot out so that you trip over. <laughs> but never mind all that, you know, or Kenneth Williams breaking wind or something. <laughs> <laughs> I had to put up with that sort of thing. And so therefore, I learned to read a script with people. Uh, so to, to, but I mean, the dad's army, of course, put another dimension on it together. But Frank was different because Frank had already received that sort of treatment with uh, the army game. Yes, I did the army game for two and a half years before most people were born. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was, I mean, that, that sort of, I suppose, made me sort of well known. But after that, I did a, a quite a nice sort of variety of things like um, Z cars and no hiding place. And, I hovered between life and death in emergency ward 10. <laughs> <laughs> I did various sort of theatre things. But then I came with one the chance to do the bigger. And it was only, I went there for one episode, and gradually the character grew. But um, I think it was because I'd worked for Jimmy Perry at, at Watford. But, yeah, um, yeah. But that yeah, that's how we got involved as well. Yeah. Yes, but one thing, you three were never involved in the one I was subjected to with Jimmy Perry. And that was the Gnomes of Dulwich. Oh, I did a Gnomes of Dulwich. Did you do one? Oh, I did. Oh, yeah. my God, what an experience that was. <laughs> I thought there was only John Laurie and myself that had done that one. No, I played oh. Lord Snow. Did you? But it was what, only the his legs. Of, the feet of Lord Snow. <laughs> the feet of Lord Snow, yes. Yeah. Well, and I was dressed in Carnaby Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jimmy Perry and Gilda, his wife, and myself, we were statues on a junk store in the gardens of number 10 Downing Street. Mm, yes. And the lovely Barry Cryer was playing Harold Wilson. But of course you only saw his feet <coughs> and his picnic lunch and his eight pea sauce bottle and that voice that he does. He yeah. does a wonderful yeah. And I forget who was playing um, Mrs. Wilson, but uh, and we were on this stall amongst other trivia and the two gnomes, two garden gnomes, um, a bust <coughs> of Napoleon which was Jimmy Perry, and a bust of Beethoven, which was me, and um, a Dresden Shepherdess, which was uh, uh, Gilda Perry. And the tagline was, at the end of the sale, when it started to rain, the only two items left on the store were the two notes. <laughs> Everything else had been sold. <laughs> yes, yes uh, it, was, it was one of those strange things that it Jimmy, was a very strange Jimmy series. thought up. But um, yes. I mean, people don't think up strange ideas then we'd have no progress in entertainment. Well, no, we wouldn't have started this, would we? We'd have started off. Oh, dear. Right, another question. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I just interject for a yeah. second? <clears throat> I've just come down here from Scotland today, and I've been made a member of the society for the very, you know, today. I appreciate it very, very much. I would like to come on a more serious note here to a poor gentleman here, um, we're all here, there's nostalgia, there's, there's anecdotes coming right left and centre, which I love, because I'm the first fan of Dad's Army. I would like to hear from our four um, colleagues and, and here, just how they think, or how they feel about the, the, the effect that is taking place in 1996. Well, my bank manager's quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's because, I mean, it, it, you know, Rosie, it, you look through things with rose-colored glasses when they're in the past, yes. is, anyway. Uh, you've, got two, you've got two audiences. You've got the, uh, the Wrinklies, which I consider myself, I'm one. Uh, <laughs> one, two, three, four. <laughs> and uh, so I think that you've got that audience who look back on something that's rather gentle. There's nothing really, you know, uh, there's nothing savage, there's nothing uh, uh, about that program, really, uh, as opposed to, to some other programs which are really rather aggressive nowadays. But that's fine. I'm not saying that, not criticizing them, but that's comedy is a bit aggressive, and so therefore this is a rather gentle program. It's a bit of Laurel and Hardy, it's a bit of Buster Keaton, it's a bit of Max Sennett. Um, uh, Arthur's character is probably part of. Rob Wilson and Sandy Powell, that sort of thing. So it's back in nostalgia. And for the very youngsters, it is 
again, you've got this, this you've got this, this Max Senate, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton effect. Now people are falling about, they're falling into water, they're falling off bikes, they're do, doing all sorts of things, a lot of visual humour. So therefore you're collecting two audiences again. Um, I mean, I don't think there's anything more to it than that. It's, and it's very simple humour. It's very simple. Most direct, it's like the old uh, Cowboys and Indian films, you know who the baddies are and the goodies. Yeah. I knew that the three of us are going to try and uh, mess up Mannering's plans. <laughs> you knew that before it started. Um, and so, but when it happened, uh, we were on the losing side eventually um, at the end of it. But it was a bit of fun during that half hour when we were trying to mess, mess them up. So really, it's quite simple. Yeah. And it's, um, it's going on against us again in, in January. I mean, I, I think one of the things, the, the great thing about it is that the program was based on characters. Yeah. Yeah. And all the characters are funny in themselves. Yeah. And Bill has also got it right that it has this wonderful thing of this muddled headed bank manager running this platoon who always, through it all, comes out on top <laughs> just in the same way that William in the William books does the most yes. dreadful thing yes. but always comes out on top in the end. Yeah. You know, this is a wonderful thing. And I think the other thing, if all the Perry Croft shows have been set in a particular uh, place in the past, Heidi High in the 50s, uh, Ragman Lord in the 30s, and so they don't date. And I think it yeah. is this yeah. gentle, unaggressive humour that yeah people really want today and I'm quite prepared to criticise some of the present shows which are very aggressive oh, and oh, very unfunny yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 And it is that, that bit of simple simplicity about the humour. Yeah. Sure of it. And also of course with Dad's Army you've got that other big um, uh, some time ago where people used to say oh yes uh, my father uh, was in the home guard and of course he's absolutely right and now they're saying my grandfather was in that. <laughs> uh, and of course, absolutely, yes, he told me stories. And, and it's absolutely so. Therefore, because of the 1940s, because there was a home guard, it is actually, there you are, you've got a truthful uh, connection to, yeah. to our history. Really, yes, it's, 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 yes. I mean, it'll probably be used as uh, certainly costume research yeah. and things yeah. like that. Oh, A-level, A-level. Uh, oh, yes. A-level <laughs> studies. Yes, yeah. I'm absolutely sure about that. Yeah. I think also there's a great deal of affection. Yes. In some episodes, Mannering would defend the others in the platoon, like Walker. Oh, yes. To say he's yes. a dying oh, yes. believer. Oh, he believed yes. in yes. his men. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. he believed in them. That's affection. That, yes. That's the great thing, yes. But um, I. I never heard that episode. I, I mean, I couldn't see it, but I mean, I never heard that episode before that was shown earlier. But a marvelous bit where Mannering comes and says, "Now I'm prepared to be a private if I can't be." Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. that actually stands What's for the spirit something. Of the, man, the, spirit yeah. of the spirit of yeah. a whole sort of yeah. range of things. But another thing I liked was uh, only a few days ago, a friend of mine said to me, "He said, Colin, he said at the moment when it comes to comedy programmes on television." At least I know with Dad's Army, it's the one program I can leave the kids in front of the set without having to bother what they're watching. Yeah. 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 Yes, I think I think one one has to think of that. You must also not forget the wonderful, some of the wonderful comedy from uh, "Till Death Is Do Part." Oh, yeah. the step to the sun. I mean, when you watch the rising Dad, and you see the pace that Rossiter takes yes. that dialogue of long takes. Not oh, just cut here, cut here, yeah. but long takes. Now you try and memorize that at the speed that Rossiter can yes. deliver those words. Uh, it's, it's superb. So I mean, there were other programs which were Oh yes, which were well, it was a great era for, for <coughs> comedy. For comedy, yes. Were there any times when you had to reshoot scenes many times to get them right? Many times. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> uh, not, not particularly for the words. I think everybody. You know, we uh, we were pretty good on the words. It was it was for various reasons. Yeah, yeah some were technical, weren't they? Yeah, yes. yes. And if you wanted, the great thing about filming outside is you could experiment because you've got natural light. Yeah. Uh, and so you could you could experiment. Yeah. If suddenly somebody said, 
wouldn't be a funny idea if I fell out of this tree or <laughs> 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 I got run over by that And car. David Croft would keep that. And David and Croft. Enigmatic. David Croft said, let's have a go at it. Yes, yes. Yes. Let's get under the car and see if the wheels go over. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't work, we'll always go back to the first one. <laughs> yes. 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 I remember the times he'd just shake his head very quietly. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. But do you remember in in the studio sometimes? Uh, who was it? Was it Clive? One night um, we had to do a retake of something or other. A retake? Well, one of the retakes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure whether it was Clive or John Laurie dashed out to the audience and said, "Please, next time." Laugh twice as hard, otherwise we'll be here all bloody night. <laughs> 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 broken the banister. Yes. And yes. trying to keep yes. the audience impetus, because yeah. we're a huge yeah. audience yeah. in the studio. Yeah, we did, yeah. Well, we're Studio yeah. 8, we were the biggest studio, weren't we? I think Studio 8 is the biggest studio. I, mean, I, I did all the, the warm-ups. You did the warm-ups, Bill. Yes, yeah. I know. Mean, yeah. which, which was not yeah. really easy sometimes, because I was going out and being very chummy with the audience, yes. and then coming back and shouting at everybody in there. And of course, yeah. still having your own lines to remember so as well. Yeah. 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 So it was, yeah. that wasn't, and I remember one night when a note came down, we suddenly stopped, and they said, the tapes run off the reel or something. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. And I was out there for about half an hour chatting away. Uh, I think it was all, it was all right after about half an hour, but I got fed up for that. I think that was the night you introduced all the back line of the chorus as well. Was it? I think you got us all on that night. <laughs> yes, yes. I think you were discussing pantomime with me that I was going to be doing at the Palace Theatre Watford. <laughs> and you were discussing pantomime with me just to fill in the time. <laughs> One for you, Colin. Sorry? One for you, if you don't mind. You know, the main characters is obviously there to be a limit on the script. There had to be backward boys, otherwise there'd be too many people coming forward. The script would yes. gone forever. Yeah. But as you were in so many episodes, did you never feel that sometimes you should have had a more permanent or, or your own private episode as the others did? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was part of a team, and Arthur always considered us, didn't he, Bill, as yeah, part of the yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. But as you, we, as you in so many, and the sponge was always there in the background somewhere, you had a few lines. Yes, yes, didn't you yes ever, I did. Didn't yes. you ever feel, although it's very generous of course, because you could have just kept it in the back and be done. No, you thought of the check. Yes, the only criteria the I've ever had in this business. <laughs> Yes. Sort the money out first. Who was it? Right. Was it Sir Noel said uh, when somebody asked him, "What is my motivation?" Money. Your motivation is the check at the end of the week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I'm No. Answer, 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 no. Um, no. It. Um, but sometimes we got frustrated. Sometimes we thought, well, "Poor old Sponge. He's been there for years. <laughs> <laughs> All he's got are one or two lines. Perhaps." You know. Yes, but I hope I did them well. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. How's that for fishing? <laughs> tell you Absolutely. that uh, one for us a very tragic experience was when dear Jimmy Beck suddenly oh, died yeah. Yeah. and we were doing uh, things that go bump in the night yes. and that's the one way you, if you see it Jimmy's on the outside location shots but once we get into what we think is the haunted house uh, in fact we had to have, we had to have a quick Sunday morning rehearsal for that, didn't yeah, we? They rewrote. Well, they, they, yeah, because they did Jimmy quick, hadn't died then. No, but they had to do a quick rewrite yeah, yeah. over it. Yeah. And I was dragged in on Sunday morning to climb on that bed oh, yes, that yeah. they were all trying to sleep on That's instead it. of Jimmy Beck. You know, but uh, I mean, it's a sad way to come up. But uh, he got a old sponge. Did got a? I mean, he finished up in the last series on the front row oh, yeah, yeah, of yeah. the chorus. Yeah. Usually at the non-working end. <laughs> I mean, if my friend here was coming slagging off the Captain Mannering and the sergeant, and the shot was there, I'd be at the other end of the line. But I, I did manage to get to the front line in the end. Do you think, think you wonderful? should have been in the front line more after James Beck passed away? No, 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 that wasn't the nature of the programme at all. No, there was, you said there was no question about replacing Jimmy Beck. I think you should have came in the front line more. No, well, well, no, 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 no. You see, that's where you got it wrong. That they had to come away, come right away from it. Yeah, they had to come right away. 
That was the truth, and they didn't like it at all. Well, no, but they had to come away from it. Yes. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I thought Talfin was very good, and I, the fact is that I really left him out of that, that album, which is going to be sorted out in the British. Yeah. Um, I mean, Talfin came into a series, which is a very difficult thing to do. It's not easy, because they, were all, they all had their egos, and uh, they went straight up, who's this fellow coming in? That was the sort of thing, wait a minute. Uh, you know, but Tarpon came straight in, and if you watch some of the episodes, I've seen a couple of them uh, recently. I mean, he was very forceful. Oh, he did, yes. He didn't hang at the back, he got straight in, uh, which was very good, I think. I thought he was excellent. No, it just, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't meant to replace Jimmy Crow. They didn't want to do that, but they wanted to, you had to sort of really forget that that character of Walker for a while because it wasn't any good trying to... So why did they bring him in as a character then? then well, they, that they, they brought him in to, to, to distract from the fact from that there was a gap there. Yes. 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 And it well, wouldn't have been fair on Colin no, to, to no. suddenly put him in that, but it was a terrible position. There was a, um, a period in the late 50s, <laughs> early 60s when people went out of a programme for whatever reason they replaced them with another actor, but gave them the same character. And I mean, this was absolute disaster. Mm. And I, I, I had a letter from um, um, Lynn McGranger, who's in Home and Away, I think. I mean, she's got, anyway. And, and she wrote and said one of their actresses had been um, in a hospital for six weeks, and they just replaced her with another actress playing the same part. Well, it must be terribly confusing, so it's a hopeless thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Was that the case with a feature film as well? If they wanted to replace uh, the main characters with more well known, like Mrs. Pike. And yeah, Mark. Miss Fraser was in the film, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Well, from the, the film company's <coughs> point of view, uh, that was their, well, that was their, I mean, they, they could do that. And they decided that uh, um, Miss Fraser was a name then, she'd done quite a lot of films. Actually, it didn't make, and I don't think it made any difference, because Dad's Army was the top of the bill. Well, that, that was the name. I knew it was a great mistake, actually. Yes. I mean, I, I, I love Liz Fraser. I yeah. think she's yes. wonderful actress. Yes. But Janet had created the part. But Janet had created yeah. the part, yeah. yes. Yeah. Can I just say, while I remember, Pamela Cundell, who plays Mrs. Fox, is here playing Brighton at the moment, otherwise she'd have been here, and she sends her love to everyone. Ah, oh, thank you very much. I mean, uh, Arthur and Pat and Clive. And that yeah, oh, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Great. Right. right, a couple more quick Good questions. Good couple more questions. Uh, yes, he's ready. Oh, yes. right, right. Uh, this one's from Sue Jeffries. Can you tell us anything about filming by the windmill? Because there is a very smelly pig farm next door now. Was it there then? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't film. I don't think I was in the episode, was I? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. I, was. I don't think I went anywhere near that. No, I, I don't know. Uh, no, I, don't, I think uh, it was Clive and some yeah. berserk animal. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't I? Yes, I, I remember. No, I don't think I was in it. I can't remember that. But I was near the, near the water. Wasn't they doing some. Wasn't he Bill, you were always near water. <laughs> no, wasn't, he, wasn't he in a. Yeah, that was filmed separately, Bill. That was filmed at Stanford. Was it? It is, and it was interlocked on BBC. Oh, yeah. No, I don't, I don't think I went there. No, no, no. no. I, don't I don't remember any smelly thing. No, 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 I don't remember any smelly thing. It's filmed at Drinkmore. Places at Drinkmore. Or Drinkstone, I'll take it on. It's actually, natural fact, it's a pig pot. So you don't want to go anywhere near it. Right. Well, don't tell Private Pike, because he's used to bombs. Final question I've got here is for Bill. Did you find it difficult, even as a professional actor, to adopt such an abrasive attitude as was required by Hodges? Uh, uh, no, I gotta say no. I just uh, signed the contract, shouted. <laughs> Hope that I'd get booked for another one. If I didn't, I'd get another job somewhere else. Uh, if you read that book, you can see that I've never cared about. Uh, very much about whether I worked here, there, or anywhere. It never bothered, bothered me, and it wouldn't care. And I've got to say now that when people stop me, I have been no, known to be rude, and I've been stopped in my tracks. And people have said, "Oh, I've seen you on the television." I said, "Excuse me, I'm shopping." 
Oh, yes, I do. Oh, well, you're a bit like that, I yes, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting a tin of beans now. Yeah, yeah. I've got a trolley here with messes and stuff. Right, it's a trolley. Oh, I've seen you on the television. Oh, I... <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, I, I have known to do that because I, I have ah. I cut the two lives off, you see. I, I'm, not, I'm not very good. When people actually do stop me in the street and they say, oh, uh, I, do I know you? I say, I don't know. <laughs> it I, I, I doesn't really, it's never dawned on me, and, and honestly, I've, I've never been very stage struck at all. It's, to me, it's been a job of work, and a very pleasant one, and a very pleasant yeah. one, and I've met a lovely lot of people, but I've never been very stage struck. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of those things. Um, I'm, I'm always, I mean, I mean now, today, if I met you in the street, I would probably remember you more than you might remember me, because I'm pretty good on faces, and that would be lovely. But when actual people come up to you, strangers, and say, oh, yeah, well, oh, when I see them, <laughs> <laughs> she is aggressive, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was, I was with Bernie Cribbins the other day, and a fella came up, we were talking and having a cup of tea, and a fella came up with a bloody red camera and a microphone. He said, uh, ITN, could you come yes, out? Yes, I saw you. <laughs> so, I said, just a <laughs> So, Bernard said, oh my God, I thought you were going to clock him. <laughs> so he said, come outside and do an interview. I said, we're having a cup of tea. Yeah. Pardon me. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> so he said, oh, I, I do it. I'm very sorry. I apologize. I said, thank you. That's all right. <laughs> now, what do you want? I mean, you know, you sometimes you do get rather good people. And we can be rude inside our business, but I don't know about that. It's bad. Um, some people don't bother manners, do they? Did anybody see the stage version of the Shaftesbury Theatre? Or on tour? Or on tour? Yes, I did. <laughs> the end, towards the end of the run at the Shaftesbury Theatre, when uh, the notices went up and the tour had been announced, and I said to God, to Arnold Ridley, Godfrey, are you going on the tour, Arnold? And we just celebrated his 80th birthday on his photo there. And he said, oh yes, if I don't go on tour, they'll think I've retired. <laughs> <laughs> Right, yes, yes, absolutely right, yeah. I think, my, I think my worst one is when people suddenly attack me in the supermarket and say, hey, you're not him, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, excuse me. <laughs> well, I've just had the nod that the book is ready, so I'd like to thank our guests for this, this open session. <laughs>